Hi, everybody. I'm Jim Stevens coming to you from the Flamingo Hotel here in Las Vegas, Nevada, site of this weekend's Hall of Fame Classic. And welcome to the first ever Kazoom Foods magazine. Each month, we're going to bring you highlights, reports, interviews from all around the world of table soccer. This week, of course, here from Las Vegas, and we'll have all the information for you from this tournament, along with a very informative report on the world of Asian table soccer from Kazoom Foods magazine contributor Fred Gower, and a brand new top 10 list from the always entertaining Joe Hamilton. But first, let's go back one week as we covered an event, a Hall of Fame Classic warm-up down in Phoenix, Arizona. Cameraman Frank Martinez and I drove south from our Durango, Colorado home this past February 28th, traveling through some of the most beautiful country in America's southwest on our way to the Grand Canyon state of Arizona to cover another exciting event for Inside Foos and Kazoom. Our good friends Brad Chamberlain and Bill Nolan were running a Las Vegas warm-up event that was promising to give us plenty of red-hot action. Hi everybody, welcome to Arizona, land of canyons, mountains, Huge cactus and one of the hottest deserts in all the world. And the action has certainly been red hot all weekend long here in Mesa, Arizona, as players from across the American Southwest have come together to compete for championship honors while also preparing for next week's Las Vegas Hall of Fame Classic. The best foozers in the Southwest region are fine-tuning their skills here at the Cactus Moon Sports Grill in Mesa in anticipation of next week's big event, while also seriously competing for titles here in Arizona, which has become a growing force on the U.S. table soccer scene. Promoters Brad Chamberlain and Billy Nolan have really lit a fire under a local player base that is continuing to grow. I've been in Phoenix for about five years, been playing foosball for about 30. Started playing in the Cactus Moon about three years ago, and uh, you know my philosophy is really to run the bigger tournaments and to run a weekly draw. I uh, really work closely with Billy here, who uh, runs foosball leagues, and those foosball leagues are really what's developing our player base. We made an effort a while ago to start adding new players, and in order to do that, We've done some things like added some handicap tournaments and created a league. We did a lot of work on software and all to make it cooler. Tournaments have gone from uh, six teams a week to 10, 11, 12, and three different nights a week. And half of those players weren't even playing three years ago. The open events here this weekend were extremely competitive, but it was Tucson, Arizona pro Ezekiel Cervantes who was the tournament's big star. Zeke won the open singles title against U.S. Tour veteran Don Swan in a tough final match. Cervantes and his partner Ben Cardenas also faced the talented Ross Lancey and Jim Sherman in the open doubles final. Lancey shooting the pull shot and again finding the hole this time down the middle. Lancey and Sherman got off to a quick start but Cervantes and Cardenas fought Zeke back. Takes his time and finds a very tight near side of the goal. And eventually won the title giving Cervantes right an impressive daily double. Nope. At home and there it is. Ezekiel Cervantes and Ben Cardenas. I know I have a few tools that um, th that I can take advantage of, and you know in this game, if you're patient and you're able to figure out your opponent, uh, you can you can really take advantage of a lot of their weaknesses. Just trying to put some hard shots on goal and help help my partner out here and uh, get him the ball. So, uh, but hats off to Sherm and Lancey, they, they're a tough team. After a great weekend of tournament action, cameraman Frank and I are back on the road. Next stop, Las Vegas. It really was a lot of fun covering that event last weekend in the Arizona desert. Brad Chamberlain, Bill Nolan and company really doing a great job of promoting the sport in the greater Phoenix area. Next, Kazoom Foos reporter Fred Gower now brings us a comprehensive look at the world of Asian table soccer. Ni hao and welcome to the Kazoom Asia Foosball Report. My name is Fred Gower. I'm a Canadian-born foosball player, and I've been living and playing foosball here in China for the better part of the last year. I've had a chance to play all across Asia and against most of the best players. So, let's have a look at Asian table soccer. Personally, I've only traveled a short time to Western Asia in and around the Middle East, but I have played against some of the top players from there at various tournaments around the world. The four groups I know the best are from Iran, Kuwait, the United Arab Emirates, or UAE, and Turkey. The style of play in Iran is very old school. Five bar shooting, pull shots, back pins are all still popular. But the Iranians play that style very, very well. Their men's team came within one match of defeating the eventual gold medal Belgian team at the ITSF World Cup in France a few years ago. 
And last year, one of their star players was leading Tony Spriedemann by two games to none before Tony stormed back to win three straight in winning the Open Singles title at the 2013 Fireball World Championship in Malaysia. Foosball in Kuwait has not been in existence for very long, but the results have already been very impressive internationally. Some of the Kuwaiti players spent years working or going to school in Europe where they picked up the game. Despite this, I would still describe most of their players as having a very North American style of play. They have also traveled to several international tournaments, and the game in Kuwait seems to be growing rapidly both in size and in strength. Foosball in the UAE was first introduced by Mikdad Suwaidi. Born in the UAE, Mikdad spent several years living and studying in the US and brought his pro-level knowledge and some tornado tables with him when he moved back to the UAE. I met Mikdad and his players in Malaysia, where they took on the best players from Eastern Asia at some of Asia's largest foosball events. Like many places in the world, the game in the UAE seems to have been affected by the soft global economy over the last few years. But Mikdad and his young UAE phenom, Rashid Al Nasseri, did extremely well at major tornado events in 2013. I was able to travel to Turkey for the first time last year. The game in Turkey is actually considered illegal for the most part, and purchasing international quality tables there is currently impossible. Despite this, the table soccer scene there is alive and well, as I saw while vacationing in Istanbul. But they are hopeful that the government will soon change their view as seeing foosball as being gambling to that of it being a legitimate sport. At that time, I can foresee big growth for the game, known there as Langert. I have seen foosball is also growing in areas like Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan and India but I have not had a chance to meet with players from there in several years. Turning our focus now to Eastern Asia, the leaders here for years were Malaysia and Japan. One-time Tornado representative and former world champ Steve Murray personally went to Malaysia to show the young players there what the program looked like. When I went to Kuala Lumpur for the first time in 2004, I saw bars with 15 well-maintained Tornado tables full three or four nights a week. These days, foosball in Malaysia is shrinking in numbers but still has a very passionate promoters like Cyrus Fu and star players like Natalie Tay. The main table there these days is now Fireball, and they are running two major ITSF certified events this year. In Japan, Joe Ueno was the main promoter there for years, and star player Hiromi Okamura is still the most active player internationally these days. The main tables there are still Tornado and Bonzini, but there are also some Fireball tables there these days as well. Japanese players can be seen at events all across Asia, as well as the ITSF World Cup in France, and in some of the major US events. Taiwan is quite recent to foosball, but star player and main promoter Jia Huang has come a long way in a very short time. Taiwan events are the best run events that I have been to in Asia. At these events you will find strong players on the table and great hosts off the table. Men, women, young and old are all excited about playing the game in Taiwan. Due to their close proximity to powerhouse Malaysia, the Singapore foosball program has been able to grow very rapidly. And though still small, they are a very powerful group of players. Hong Kong foosball has been growing rapidly of late. Originally formed by star player Tarek Alali, and now with the infusion of new energy from local players like Graham and Alfred, the Hong Kong program now boasts one of the nicest training centers in all of Asia. I'm sure that you'll be hearing lots from the Hong Kong players in the near future. Mainland China has been where I have spent most of my time while living in Asia. Initially, I struggled trying to find decent tables and players, but all of that changed once I met Dennis Jiang, the manufacturer of the Fireball table. Dennis was already well connected to the established player base and promoters in China, and through him I was able to connect with the players and teach them what I was able to about growing the game here North American style. Even though I was able to help, the game is growing quite well in China mainly due to efforts of people like Dennis, as well as Stephen Shan in Lanzhou, Charlie Xu in Shenzhen, and Felix Wu in Dalian. Stephen and Charlie are former foosball students of mine back when I first moved to China. While most of my students just ended up playing the game for fun, Stephen and Charlie are still very much actively involved. Stephen runs and coaches an intramural program at a university in Lanzhou, where 350 people play the game regularly. The best of these players form Team Lanzhou, and come to our major tournaments twice a year in Shanghai. Charlie runs a foosball class for all nine-year-olds at a middle school in Shenzhen. It is part of their recreational curriculum. One year ping pong, another year chess, etc. Every week about 30 players per class 
and about 450 players in total get a lesson from Charlie and then get to play and get graded annually. The best players are invited to join the Shili school team, which dominates the junior competitions in China and effectively forms the Chinese national junior team at international foosball competitions. In Dalian, my friends Felix Wu, Lydia Liu, and Robert Ploger are organizing China's biggest foosball event yet, the Dalian Open set for May 2014. The event has locked in sponsors and expects to see players attend from all over Asia and hopes to attract some of the top international pro masters in the game as well. In Shanghai, we've been able to attract mostly foreign-born players that are living and working in Shanghai for a few years. We have a great scene here, playing three or four times a week, but it is when we host the bigger events that draw players from all over China that things really get fun. Go to shanghaifoosball.com for more information on us or to ask us for help in contacting any Asian foosball promoters. You know, it's extremely difficult for the Asian players to get to tournaments in the West. Visas, the relative costs, it's very tough. So the best way to see Asian table soccer is for you from the West to come to us. We promise to be tough opponents on the table and great hosts off the table. So, this is Fred Gower for the Kazoo Maker Table Soccer Report. Sai Chan. Thank you, Fred. Great job and a very informative report. In other international news, the Warrior Table has become the newest ITSF official table. It will join Garlando, Bonzini, Leonhardt, and Roberto Sport as the five tables used in international multi-table events. Congratulations to Warrior President Brendan Flaherty and the entire Warrior team. Former ITSF world champion Joe Hamilton is also going to be a regular contributor to the Kazoom Foods magazine. So sit back and enjoy the first edition of Joe Hamilton's Top 10. Hey guys, this is Joe Hamilton. Thank you for watching. Uh, this is Joe Hamilton's Top 10. In this particular segment, I like to break down an area within foosball and then run through with you my top 10 for that particular area. Now in this particular episode, I'm going to be doing the top 10 showmen or women of foosball. What exactly is a showman? A showman is someone that's not afraid to wear their heart on their sleeve. Someone who walks a fine line between confidence and arrogance. A showman can do things from the sublime to the ridiculous on the table. But most importantly, a showman is someone who always has a crowd. Not just for his skills on the table, but more importantly, for the skills off the table. All right, in at number 10, I have Terry Rue. Terry Rue's style is so high energy, uh, not afraid to show his emotion, super talented. He can do anything on a foosball table, whether it's a back pin, front pin, push kick, pull kick. And one thing is for certain, when he scores, everyone within about a five mile radius hears it. I mean, he'll stroke a dead bar pull shot or a hit the crispest push kick, and he'll let out a yeah, or a roo, or any kind of noise to get him pumped up. The energy he displays is unmatched in, in any walk of life. I've never seen someone with as much energy as Terry Rue. I mean, does he just wake up in the morning like, yeah, it's six o'clock in the morning, let's go. Who knows? Either way, Terry Rue, number 10. Moved into the offensive position, yeah. angles it into the goal. Yeah. All right, at number nine, I have Bobby Diaz. Quite simply put, one of the greatest goalies of all time. And when he made blocks, he let you know that about it. Pull shot, it's three, two. Was it confidence? Was it arrogance? Yeah, I'm not sure. Probably a little of both. But one thing is for sure, is not only could he talk smack, but he could back it up. I mean, how many guys did you know who could smack talk versus Tony Spreaderman, Billy Pappas, and Frederick Collignon on the table and make the key blocks in the key situations in the game? A master of mental warfare, my pick for number nine, Bobby Diaz. Alright, at number eight, I have Portugal's Paul Nunes. Paul is a very entertaining player to watch, one of my personal favourites. Very scrappy, willing to fight for every ball, and when he does score, again, he's another guy who will let you know about it. He screams a lot, he gets the crowd involved. 
a very good rollover shooter when he wants to be, but more importantly, he's a showman because of all of the off-table antics. You know, if a rat goes in, he'll physically be so upset, it's almost like you've just slapped him in the face. A very, very fun player to watch. Paul Nunez, number eight. All right, guys, at number seven, I have Cindy Head. Cindy always drew a crowd. She played with unrivaled tenacity, fierceness, determination. One of the few players who could literally scream you off a table if she wanted to. Um, with about six million titles to back up her screaming, there's obviously some method to her madness, and uh, it clearly works for her. You know, also, with Cindy being a policewoman, one thing's for sure, you won't catch me breaking any laws down in Alabama. Cindy Head, number seven. And at number six, Nathan Winter. Nathan was an extremely talented player. No one knew whether he was about to do a push kick, a rollover, a double pump pull kick, a left-handed shot from the back. I mean, he would needle you so bad throughout a match and get in your head so bad that by the end of the match, you had no idea what you were going to do. A man who firmly believes he is one of the best players of all time, a man who's very fun to watch, Nathan Winter, number six. And at number five, I have Scotty Weidman. Scotty was very entertaining to watch. An incredibly cocky individual with an extremely high football IQ to back it up. Some of my favorite showman moments of Scotty include scoring on himself at 4-0 and shouting across the table, I'm not gonna let you get the fifth point, or maybe sometimes finishing off with a great pull shot and then standing away from the table with his arms raised as if to suggest I'm the greatest player of all time. Never a dull moment at number five, Scotty Weidman. And at number four, I have Don Swan. Don Swan is one of my favorite players to watch and certainly my favorite dress player of all time. This is a guy who would wear one hat on top of another extremely vibrant colored headbands, tassels on his arms that only the ultimate warrior would wear. Just an incredibly entertaining character. He would always engage the crowd with his table talk banter, and quite frankly, if he wasn't a foosball player, he should have been a comedian. My pick for number four, Don Swan. Point for Don Swan, he leads four two. And there's nothing Terry Moore can do at Terry this point. Moore loses the ball, it rolls to the five of Don Swan, it hammers it home. And a 1997 Masters champion, shockingly, this Don Swan, unbelievable. Number three, I have Tommy Atkinson. Anyone who knows foosball knows who Tommy Atkinson is. One of the most talented players of all time, and he has been entertaining crowds ever since he burst onto the scene in 93, winning those two world titles. He screams at his opponent. He talks animal noises at his opponent. He talks trash to his opponent. My personal favorite is when I watch him block his opponent without even looking on the table. He's looking directly at his opponent while he's blocking the ball. It's simply hilarious to watch. A true crowd favorite and a genuine crowd pleaser. My number three, Tommy Atkinson. Looking for the win. Atkinson strokes at home. My pick for number two is Jamal Alalu. If you want entertaining foosball, then look no further than Jamal. He's another one of these players that walks a very fine line between genius and madness, but his brand of foosball is about as entertaining as it gets. He doesn't take any longer than three seconds, and he can attack you from any rod at any given time. Here's Alalu attempting the aerial. He pins against that back wall, sends it up and in Jamal Alalu with the aerial. Jamal is another one of these players as well that wears his heart on his sleeve and unfortunately he has suffered big mental blow-ups in a lot of matches. As a fan, however, this is just another reason that makes him so exciting to watch. Almost the complete showman in my opinion, Jamal Alalu, number two. Yeah, I'm degraded. I'm going long. You guessed it, my number one, Johnny Horton. Simply put, the greatest showman of all time. He had that Muhammad Ali style of trash talking, but make no mistake about it, he could float and sting like a bee as well. 
This is a guy who's been winning world titles for three decades, winning in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. He would hit a long, fast, dead bar pull shot, and then recoil from bumper to bumper to bumper to bumper. Well, you get the point. It was intimidation at its finest. A man who I believe genuinely has the Messiah complex. Johnny Horton, number one. Block and three, Johnny Horton fires it home. What a performance, and Johnny Horton going nuts. Johnny Horton just loving the moment. Loving the moment. Great. That really brings back memories. Great job by the one and only Joe Hamilton in putting together his list of the top ten showmen in the sport. I can't disagree with Joe's list too much, but I would have had German star Christopher Marks on my top ten list of showmen. His combination of intensity, skill, and showmanship have made him one of the most entertaining players on the International Table Soccer Tour over the last few years. There was also a rare Frederic Collignon sighting this past March as the world's greatest player won both singles and doubles at a Leonhardt Masters Series event in Luxembourg. While the world's top-ranked player, Robert Atha, won both major titles at the Leonhardt Spring Open in England one week earlier. This week... The best American players are here in Las Vegas, Nevada to compete for championship honors at the Hall of Fame Classic. Some of the biggest names in table soccer have gathered here at the Flamingo Hotel to compete in America's first major championship of 2014. And it was Ryan Moore, Tony Spredeman, and Robert Morris who have dominated the U.S. Tour over the past two years who did all of the major damage here this weekend. In open singles, Mares defeated Moore in an amazing semifinals performance. Only be appropriate for Robert to close it from goal. He has scored eight. Make it nine. What a performance by... And Robert then faced Mar his doubles partner, Spredeman, in the championship final. Tony, who rarely loses a singles competition, was superb, using his extraordinary one-on-one -on -one skills to defeat his good friend, Mares. Spredeman strokes at home, far side, and there it is. So Tony Spredeman defeats Robert Mares in two sets to claim the 2014 Hall of Fame Classic Open Singles Championship. A uh, very satisfying win. I got to play one of my best friends and my partner uh, in the finals, Rob, Rob Mares, and uh, you know we couldn't ask for anything more. I think perhaps last year was the greatest year that any American table soccer player has ever had. You won the World Championship on Tornado in doubles and singles. You won the International ITSF Multi-Table World Championship with Mares. Uh, this past year I've been 100% committed and uh, I'm playing full time and I think that's what it takes, you know, it, to have a year like that you need to dedicate all of your time, all of your effort um, into it and I, I think it just showed. Spreidemann also claimed the mixed doubles title with partner Deliza Bombach. Meanwhile, in doubles, defending champions Ryan Moore and Bobby Diaz were again the class of the field here in 2014 as they defeated ITSF world champion Spredeman and Mares to once again claim the title. Win the championship right here. For the title, for the second year in a row, Ryan Moore chokes it to the far side and there it is. What a performance by Ryan Moore and Bobby Diaz who defeat Tony Spredeman and Robert Mares in two sets to win their second consecutive Hall of Fame Classic Open Double. Uh, our main plan was not to focus on Tony, it's to focus on Rob. We had to control him because he's always he's always clear the ball good on me, he's always got a couple points. We had to shut that down, and, and we did. That's all we really focused on was our zone. You have to have a plan. If you don't have a plan, then you're going in blind. In the women's events here in Las Vegas, it was the great Cindy Head who overcame a strong performance by Canadian Linda Lee to win yet another open singles title while Jackie Hahn and Kristen Grogan surprised the women's doubles field to claim their first major titles. And that's going to wrap it up from Las Vegas, Nevada. We hope you've enjoyed the first ever Kazoom Foos magazine. For Fred Gower, Joe Hamilton, and everyone who contributed to this production, I'm Jim Stevens, and we'll see you Foos it.
Now, what is a showman I hear you at? Give me the stuff. Give me the stuff. Someone that's not afraid to wear their heart on it. Nailed it! Someone that walks a fine line between confidence and arrogance. Nailed it! Sane, lots of energy, never afraid to display his emotions. Uh, Nailed it! Terry, I mean, I'm just, my blood, my blood pressure is dangerously high thinking about it.